Hi guys, it is an arctic blasted day here in the end times here in South Austin, Texas. We have made it to Monday, March 3rd, 2014. So it is time for me to bring you my, I don't know what I call this rant, a healthy planet, sick economy, healthy economy, sick planet rant is what my economic meltdown roundup rant has evolved to here in 2014. And this is where I go on the pages of the mainstream media just to, for anyone who does not understand the inverse relationship between the economy and the environment, I try to pick out six stories kind of comparing and contrasting uh, that link between the economy and the environment. And so I'm going to start right off. I did a full tongue-in-cheek, sarcastic, uh, ironic rant yesterday about this story from the French news service AFP. Ancient beasts roam Spain's wilderness and so this story, this mainstream media story, is talking about the wilderness they are talking about here in this story is kind of on the borderline between Spain and Portugal, where agri the agribusiness, mainly ranching, uh, has not gone well, so that the 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 ranching industry, probably the beef industry, has kind of dried up and blown away, and the ranchers and uh, all of their attendant problems have moved out over the years. So take a wild guess what is moving in. Farming has declined in Spain, leaving the countryside deserted. Now, the wild things are coming back. Wolves, vultures, and rare herbivores, such as these wild horses, these very rare ancient wild horses that they talk about. So what this article is about is about this whole concept of rewilding. I've had several rants, this eco-Nazi concept of trying to reintroduce large species of keystone species, uh, including predators back into lands that they were driven out of by human activity, such as ranching, and they actually talk about here in Spain how they're reintroducing. I didn't even realize, did you realize there were bison in Spain? Well, they, there are. There are a few left, and they are rewilding the bison, and they're also talking about this here in the U.S., about moving some bison out of Yellowstone National Park to get the last genetically pure bison in the U.S. Uh, reintroduced to their former rangelands in the U.S. West and how the beef industry is fighting them. The beef industry does not want uh, bison reintroduced any more than they want wolves. But at least Spain is moving ahead and they're talking about this lynx that is, is one of the another species. So anyway, I'm going to put the link, the links to all of these stories. Uh, and let's just get down to the bottom, uh, <clears throat> the bottom of this. Uh, what this is all about. Uh, bottom line here, Spain is in general a fair bit more wild than the rest of Europe. Lots of acres are being left empty, which for wild animals 
are obviously perfect. There you go. As humans move in, every other species of animal moves out. As humans move out, every other species of animal, at, at least those that we have not obliterated off the planet, move in. This is what rewilding is all about. Okay, and let's also go to uh, many stories on this. A rare peek uh, into some good news from, uh, this is from International Business Times, right here on the financial pages of Yahoo News, uh, talking about the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, one of the single biggest enemies of big business. This is why Alex Jones, a promoter of the unlimited economic growth model, always uh, ranting about the EPA. Well, I don't believe it. Even International Business Times can't believe it that EPA is actually doing its job of protecting the environment by coming out against this new planet-eating mine, this gold and copper mine up there in Alaska. This is International Business Times story on this. Again, I'll put all the, the links. International Business Times, not exactly a left-wing environmentalist rag. EPA leans towards blocking controversial Alaska pebble mine. And this is a picture of the salmon spawning uh, up there where this uh, giant Canadian multinational mining corporation wants to move in. Okay, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency started a process on Friday that is likely to end up killing the proposed mine, constituting a major blow to its developers. Do we need any more proof? What is good for the planet-eating economy is bad for the planet, and a major blow to a, a mine developer is good news for the planet. Okay. The move by EPA comes weeks after a critical report released in January on the mine's environmental impact that warned the open pit mine could severely, severely damage regional wetlands. There you go. Uh, though no final decision has made, the process could end in a veto or other restrictions for the $6 billion project. But mine developers <clears throat> have months to debate again, and more public hearings could be scheduled. There you go. Uh, the debate over the controversial mine has been going on for years, and developers may need to redouble their efforts to convince environmental activists and officials. Yeah, yeah redouble their efforts. And, uh, and, and you better believe they're getting ready to do this. This is a quote uh, from uh, some spokesman from EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy. Quote, three years of scientific assessment provided ample reason for the EPA to believe that a mine of the size and scope of the pebble mine would have significant and irreversible negative impacts. 
the Bristol Bay fishery is an extraordinary resource and is worth out of the ordinary agency actions to protect it, close quote. There you go. Uh, here is the EPA administrator pointing out for the record for the, the Environmental Protection Agency to make a bizarre decision to actually protect the environment is an out of the ordinary agency action. The ordinary action of the EPA is to rubber stamp this shit. And this is why this is getting so much press in the uh, financial media. That good Lord, guys, we need to uh, get these guys back in line. Put them back in their corporate controlled box. Oh, boy. Uh, anyway, this is a long, in-depth story. Uh, you know, a pretty good one for the International uh, Business Times. Okay. And then, of course, you know, the Planet Eaters, how they're going to fight this. Okay, let's do a few stories about pipelines. Uh, seem to be big in the mainstream media. I mentioned this one in my End Times rant today. And I have to admit, this was news, literally news to me from Associated Press. But no surprise here. Sunken Great Lakes oil pipeline raises spill fears. There you go. A freshwater channel that separates Michigan's upper and lower peninsula, peninsulas is a premier Midwestern tourist attra attraction and a photographer's delight, blah, blah, blah. But nowadays, the Straits of Mackinac is drawing attention for something that is out of sight and usually out of mind and which some consider a symbol of the dangers lurking in the nation's sprawling web of buried oil and natural gas pipelines stretched across the bottom of the waterway at depths reaching 270 feet below the surface are two 20-inch pipes that today carry nearly 20 3 million gallons of crude oil per day. They are part of the 1,900-mile Lakehead Network. Good Lord. The pipes were laid in 1953. 1953. They have never leaked, according to the system's owner, Enbridge Energy Partners, which say the lines are in good shape and pose no threat. But a growing chorus of activists and members of Congress is demanding closer scrutiny as stepped-up production in North Dakota's Bakken region and Canada's Alberta tar sands boosts the amount of oil coursing through pipelines crossing the nation's heartland. And the Straits of Mackinac epitomizes a potential worst-case scenario for a pipeline accident. An iconic waterway, ecologically and economically significant, that could be fiendishly hard to clean up because of swift currents and deep water that is often covered with ice. 
Jesus, uh, talking about uh, all the people drawing their drinking water out, out of this place, about all the sports fishermen and the salmon and the trout. Good Lord, uh, this is uh, Andy Bushbaum from National Wildlife Federation. Quote, it is a huge pipeline carrying oil in one of the most ecologically beneficial and sensitive places in the world. A massive oil spill there would have dire and irreversible consequences, close quote. And, uh, of course, the, uh, the, uh, what is, what, what does spokes Jackie Guthrie of Enbridge have to say about their pipeline? Quote, we have invested a lot of money, time, and resources to ensure that we are using the best available technology to operate our pipelines with the utmost integrity. There you go. Uh, let's see, and who is this? Uh, I can't even remember. So one, one of the, one, one of these, uh, spokespeople, one of these planet eaters, I can move on. I just love this quote. Looking at this, uh, what is it? 53, good Lord, is it 61 year old pipeline? The 61-year-old pipeline, one of these planet eaters, quote, It's been operating there for decades and operating safely. Close quote. There you go. It's been doing just fine for 61 years. Why, would, why are these damn tree huggers bitching now? It's good for another 61 years years. Anyway, from there, let's go to the granddaddy of oil pipelines. I, I, I love th this one. I was talking about this very man yesterday. I was ranting and quoting this very man yesterday in my sermon about this book, The Corporation, The Pathological Pursuit of Profit and Power, quoting former British Petroleum CEO, what was his name? Good, Jonathan Good, uh, I'm sorry, John Brown. John Brown, and he is back in the news the day after me quoting him in, in my Doomsday Sermon right here from the business pages on Yahoo News where we have former BP CEO John Brown saying the Keystone Pipeline would be good for the environment. There you go. Uh, John Brown is still at it. Uh, Let's see, we, and so it starts off with this story I mentioned today about hundreds of students and youth organizers uh, while they were arrested protesting the Keystone Pipeline outside the White House yesterday. Uh, we have, uh, we, we have these planet eaters. Here is Warren Buffett. Uh, telling CNBC Monday that he thinks, quote, probably that the Keystone Pipeline is good for the country. Now, he was talking more about the economic benefits, but what does John Brown have to say? Okay, meanwhile, John Brown, former CEO for British Petroleum, uh, tells the Daily Ticker, uh, quote, Keystone would be good for the environment. Uh, let's see. 
how does but but as opponents worry that extra, extracting tar sands oil emits 17 percent more of the carbon pollution that contributes to climate change and reinforces u.s dependence on fossil fuels how does brown make his case his point is that people find ways of getting oil where it needs to go, whether it be trains or other forms of transportation. Okay, and, there, and they link you to a video with this full interview. Uh, but here is the quote they pulled out from John Brown. Quote, getting a simple pipeline which works safely and securely and does not require lots of movements of different vehicles, that will be very good for the environment. Close quote. Okay. Uh, and let's see. Uh, then I guess he starts talking about fracking, uh, saving the planet, uh, about burning natural gas produces less carbon dioxide than burning any other hydrocarbon, so it's a very efficient way of producing electricity. We need more, not less and if there are a choice of leaving something in the ground, we should leave coal in the ground. And so then he goes off on that red herring. So as long as our buddy John Brown uh, sure as shit not recommending we leave oil or gas in the ground, uh, let's look at uh, a couple of stories. Let's finish up with a couple of stories on fracking. This uh, today, this very morning, I mentioned in my End Times headlines from Reuters News, oil producers undaunted as Colorado mulls fracking restrictions. This is the, those greenies over there in California uh, trying to fight fracking and, and how these oil companies are completely uh, swatting them like a bunch of little... They're not even swatting them. They're just completely ignoring them. Okay. Reuters News. While Colorado environmental groups work to put a ballot measure before voters this fall that could severely hobble the U.S. energy industry. Whiting Petroleum Corporation is busy figuring out where in the state it can spend $10 billion over the next decade. Guys, this is one pretty much small potatoes oil company, Whiting Petroleum. Never heard of them. One little pipsqueak oil company in one state spending $10 billion. You know, who do you think the government of Colorado is going to listen to? Them are some little tree huggers. Whiting has little concern that the ballot an initiative will even succeed. <clears throat> Even after voters in several of the state's cities last fall to ban fracking, the Denver-based company, Denver company sees Colorado as key to its plans to sharply boost oil and natural gas production. Here is Ana Darko Petroleum Corporation has similar growth plans for Colorado, aiming to spend at least one and a half billion dollars each year for the foreseeable future to develop its more than eight hundred 
thousand acres of oil fields in Colorado. Jesus, uh, while environmentalists have long hoped Colorado's increasingly liberal population could help them stem reliance on oil, victory is far from certain and polls show environmentalists face an uphill battle. And you better believe that these energy companies are, are going to squash, do everything they can to squash this little threat. Uh, it, it goes on and on. Other operators are similarly confident. Here is WPX Energy plans to double its activity in Colorado this year. Noble Energy Company. I, I, you got to love that name. Noble Energy Company. Noble Energy Incorporated. Cranking up. All of these companies are hoping to get their share of the state's estimated 2 billion barrels of oil. Blah, blah, blah. This is what Ayn Rand was talking about in 1957. She was talking about the oil companies fracking in Colorado. And uh, her little wet dream has finally come true. And let's just close up with this one from the Daily Ticker gets right to the point here in the mainstream media on the business page for any of you pro-business people concerned don't worry the frackers have won there you go this is according to wall street journals greg zuckerman the u.s will become the world's largest oil producer by 2015. Next year, surpassing Russia and Saudi Arabia, the International Energy Agency said last year, uh, America could also become energy independent. Few would argue that energy independence is a negative. The issue has been the safety and environmental impact of how natural gas is drilled and oil, of course, as we just talked about. Uh, the process of hydraulic fracturing or fracking, then uh, they... Uh, the, uh, they go to explain that for anyone who doesn't know how, and then it talks about the story I just talked about in Colorado. But let's wrap up this rant from Greg Zuckerman. Greg Zuckerman, a writer at the Wall Street Journal and author of the book, The Frackers, The Outrageous Inside Story of the New Billionaire Wild Catters does not dispute that fracking needs to be more closely regulated, but he argues that the surge in domestic natural gas production won't ever stop. And then there's a link to a video, too, for the full interview. But we're going to wrap up this rant with this quote from Mr. Zuckerman. Quote, we depend on natural gas, and 90% of gas wells are being fracked. The frackers have won. Yes, they have. The frackers have won. The planet eaters have won. That is why there is no hope for the 
planet, the global corporatocracy led by big fossil fuels have won, the planet has lost, we are all toast, smoke them if you got them. And that will bring me to the end of my March 3rd, 2014 Healthy Economy Sick Planet rant at exactly 30 minutes. Bye, guys.